Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Sunday School Review, and I uh, appreciate you joining with us again today. We're going to jump in and discuss the Word of God, and uh, I want to get your opinion on something today. We, we're we thinking about, uh, we talked about this a while back. We never really, really did get a chance to really do it. By, by uh, setting up a Sunday school channel strictly just for Sunday, the Sunday school lessons, not as if we don't have enough of them out there already. But it's going to be kind of a win-win, I think, because I'm going to learn a whole lot more about the Word of God and, and digging more deeper and getting more, doing more research uh, into the Word of God, even more so than I'm doing now. And also it's going to help those that, uh, for, that can't attend an actual service for whatever the reason you can't, you're working, you can't get down on a Sunday morning. And so we're looking at doing that in 20, in next year, the very next year. So I want to kind of get your input on that. What do you think about uh, uh, us setting up a Sunday school channel just for Sunday school so we can really concentrate on that? It may be uh, still maybe 30 minutes, maybe a little bit less, a little bit longer. I'm not sure on that yet. So any ideas that you would have, I would love to get your ideas. You can just put them in the, in the chat or you can reach out to me on Facebook if that's better for you. Or even just, you know, just call me direct, those that have my direct number, and we'll talk about uh, some of the ideas that you have that we could do in creating a great Sunday School channel uh, in, in the upcoming year. Today, we're going to teach it a little bit different. I'm going to actually show you the notes that, uh, that I get from the commentary. We still use the International Sunday School Commentary, so I'm going to actually put the notes on the screen here today. And uh, now this thing, sometimes, you know, you, you don't see the mistakes that you make, when you doing your lesson, other folks can see all the mistakes. So if you see some words out of place and uh, misspell or whatever that's not been uh, moved over correctly, just uh, kind of to my heart, not to my head. So our lesson today is going to be uh, freedom from expectations. Freedom from expectations is going to be our lesson for today, which is a pretty, pretty powerful lesson coming from Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. And so I'm going to kind of give you a little idea of, our, and I'm going to show these notes as well, of some of the context of our lesson before getting into the actual lesson uh, today. We learned in our lesson uh, context for this week that the book of Acts is the second of a two-volume work by Luke addressed to Theophilus, Acts chapter 1, verse 1, also Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. And prior to the events of, in this lesson, Paul and Barnabas which was leaders in the first century church, have been traveling throughout Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And these travels were uh, are identified as Paul's first missionary journey in A.D. 47 to 49. You read about this in Acts chapter 13 and 4 through 14, 28. I'd encourage you to read that as well. Uh, the, two visited, the, the two visited various synagogues during that journey and where they taught from the scriptures and preach the good news, the news of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Uh, read about this in Acts 13, 32 through 33. And they were not selective in choosing their audience. They preached to both the Jews and they preached to the Gentiles. And this is in Acts chapter 14, verse 1. Now, after their journey, Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch in Acts 14, 26 and 27, a city in the modern day Syria. And the events of, uh, of Acts 15, 4 through 29, to speak a meeting sometimes called the uh, Jerusalem Council. And the council was an early attempt to answer the vital question of how to incorporate the Gentiles into the family of the people of God. And so the future of the church really depended on how uh, they was going to deal with this question down at the, at the Jerusalem Council. And many of the great men of God were there, Peter, Paul, uh, James, all these guys. John was down there. Some of the, the surviving disciples that were still living were also, also there. So this was a very, really important meeting because the Jews were trying to impose certain things on the Gentiles that were too heavy for them to deal with and that they themselves did not follow to the letter of the law themselves the whole time. So let's look at verse number, verse number one. We see conflict, conflict kind of described in Acts 15, verses 1 through 3, and also the first part, verse number 1 and 2, 2a rather, is the belief. The Bible says, and certain men which came down, came down from Judea told the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the man of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
And now, now, do we have anybody, you know of anybody, any church right now that's saying, that's saying certain things, if you don't do this, this, or this, or this, or this, just like we do it, you ain't going to be saved? Well, let's look at that, that, that journey, that journey to certain of uh, these certain men from Judea took them down to Antioch in, in, in uh, Syria, where Paul and Barnabas was teaching down there. And the visit of these certain men to the brethren was the brethren, the church down there, was seemingly an unauthorized visit. But they went down anyway. You read about this in Acts chapter 15, verse 24. Now, the point I want to make here, you got to be real careful who you let uh, teach your people. Uh, because you'll be surprised they'll bring a whole nother gospel and then do it kind of unconsciously and have your folks thinking all kind of ways. So the church had already celebrated God's work in, uh, in, in, the Gen, in the Gentiles. This is in Acts chapter 11, verse 1 through 18. So even the, and, and also in the Old Testament, the prophets in the Old Testament agreed that the incorporation of the Gentiles into the family of God was going to happen at some point. You read about that in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 1, 56, verse 6 and 7, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. So instead here now, the issue was the means through which the Gentiles was going to come into the people of God, was going into the family of God. And so the law then, the, the, the biggest argument was that since the law was given to given by God to the Jews, that the Gentiles and everybody else should just follow, come in the way through the law. They just believe the only way you're going to be saved is through the law because the law was handed down from God down to Moses for God's people. And anything, anybody else outside of the Jewish nation that's going to be incorporated got to come this way or you can't be saved. So, so in verse 2b, we see still talking about the belief. In, in, in uh, 2A, rather, uh, let's go here. Hold on one second, class. Again, y'all bear with me now. We're trying to get this thing done here. So when Paul, therefore, and, and when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no decision and disputation with them, Paul and Barnabas traveled together on a missionary journey throughout Asia. And they were the apostles and leaders of the first century church. And you read about this in Acts chapter 14, verse 14. The fact that Paul and Barnabas expressed all this argument and misunderstanding with those guys that came down wasn't no real big deal, no, no real big surprise, because they came down there saying something that Paul and, and Barnabas had not taught, and it was, it was contrary. It was contradicting what they had been teaching. So as you see in our, in our next part, these interloping visitors, these unwanted visitors brought in a message that was contradicting what Paul had already taught, which was justification by faith. And Paul said the law is very limited. Y'all can be saved, but you're going to be saved by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection because the law can identify, but the law cannot justify. And that was a point that Paul wanted to make with the people that came, with the people of God, and these interloping visitors that came down unwanted, unwanted, unwarranted, um, unauthorized, teaching God's people something contrary to what Paul and Barnabas and all the other guys have been teaching. Now, in verse 2b, we say here the parties. So they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So this thing has gotten so heated, they got to go up to, the, to what they called, as we mentioned earlier, the Jerusalem Council to get some clarification here as to what we need to do about this. And so until the question of circumcision was answered, the believers in Antioch, would, would, they was going to withhold the judgment and they, will, they was going to withhold the circumcision of the Gentiles. So the apostles in Jerusalem then were the surviving members of the 12 that were called by Jesus. You read about this in Luke chapter 6, 12 through, 15, through 16, Matthew 27 and 5, and Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So elders then serve an additional leadership position in the church. You read about this in Acts chapter 14, verse 23. James chapter 5, verse 14. And the council is one of the few places in the word of God where these two parties came together to work as a team. Speaking of a team, it's important also for church leaders now to work together. Sometimes you, you see in certain churches that deacons can't get along uh, with the pastor. Uh, or the pastor can't get along with uh, the choir. And that's, an, you know, a lot of things. So the church got to work together as a unit, as a team, 
particularly when there's a misunderstanding and not the whole church, sometimes just the leaders got to come together to resolve this issue. If the leaders can't get together, man, you got, you got some trouble on your hand. In verse three, and we see the part is still here and, and being brought on their way by and being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. So these guys are on a journey, on a real trip. Paul had a mission. Barnabas had a mission. The others that went with them had a mission to go out and make sure that they tell the word, they, they spread the message of what had just happened with the Gentiles. So the commentary talked about this a little bit by leaving the church in Antioch. It allowed Paul and Barnabas to, to see some other churches en route to Jerusalem. And it was about, about 330 miles with two cities. And it took about two weeks to go this whole distance on foot. And so these guys had to rely on the hospitality of those of the churches along the way. They had to be, well, they had to have, have something to eat. They had to be changing of clothes and, and so on and so forth. This is a 330 mile journey. And they didn't have Uber. They didn't have a taxi. They didn't have cars. They didn't have all those types of things that we have today. So Paul and Barnabas then really went on like a preaching circuit proclaiming the good news that God also had brought in the Gentiles, welcomed, welcomed, welcomed them into the family. And the Gentiles had did it. They did. They were circumcised, but they were circumcised of the heart. The things they used to do, they don't do anymore. The, the desires they used to have, there's been a change in their life. The Holy Ghost has made all the difference in their lives. And so, so conversion is turning away from evil toward God. And God kept his promise to Abraham uh, regarding blessing all the families of the earth in Genesis chapter 12 and verse number three. So God's word is always true. Now it's our job to dig into the word of God and see what the old said about the new, what the Old Testament said about the New Testament. The Old Testament concealed the New Testament is a New Testament reveal. So we got to learn about God's word and dig into it ourselves. And listen, that takes it. We just can't read it. We got to study it. Now, and, and now we see some conflict debated. We see receiving in verse four, reminding in verse five and verse six. So let's read verse four through six. And when they were come to Jerusalem, uh, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders. And they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, I want to emphasize that, which believed, saying, that is what, that it was, that, well, we'll, we'll slow it down, Ricky, that it was needful to, to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. Now, so there were Pharisees that were Christians that believed in what Jesus did, but still also believe it couldn't be an either or, it's, and, it, it's both and, okay? And that wasn't the case. That was, uh, that was the, the kind of looking over what God, what Christ had did for the church in dying on the cross. So let's look at what the commentary says about this. So the message of Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem to the Jerusalem church was focused on the work of God, what God completed through them. Not what they did by themselves, but what God did through them, which likely included the conversion of the Jews and the Gentiles. I want you to read Acts chapter 13 and 14, the whole chapters, 13 and chapter 14. So Paul and Barnabas then were fulfilling the role of real witnesses. And that's what the church right now has, uh, in my humble opinion, we've dropped the ball. We don't witness like we used to witness. We don't go out there and tell the word like we used to tell the word when we first got saved, man, we were so excited. We tell anybody that we that comes in our path, I know a man. I know a man that, that saved me and changed my life. But my goodness, it's a little bit different now. And so this, this is what we see. These guys here now were real witnesses. The Pharisees, were a sect of the first century Judaism. And their strict adherence to the law of Moses made it kind of understandable why certain Christian Pharisees still advocated for Gentile circumcision. 
Although the gospel presents, pre presents the group as, at this time, antagonistic toward Jesus, some Pharisees did believe in Jesus. Just like, you know, Saul, well, when he was converted to Paul, he was a devout Pharisee. Paul used to persecute the church before he became, before he became Paul, when he was Saul, but he became Paul. He was still a Pharisee, but he believed. And so there was some that was there that was, they still believed, but they just couldn't let go of the law of Moses because they thought it was still relevant to salvation. As a, again, the, the law identifies, but the law does not justify. The law does not have that power for justification. So the council meeting to discuss circumcision appears to be with just the leaders and not the whole church. Sometimes you see where a church is trying to get a, uh, get a, get a program done. They're trying to make a major decision and they try to incorporate 500 members, all their opinions, not necessarily a vote. Just what are you thinking? What are you thinking? What do you think? What does it, what's your interpretation of this? And they don't move an inch. So it's highly likely that this decision here was with the apostles and the teachers and leaders and elders, not the, not the entire congregation, because they wouldn't move if that were the case, more than likely. So in verse number seven, we see now the conflict is resolved. Verse seven and nine through nine, we see God's work. So let's read verse seven first. And when there had been much debate disputing, Peter rose up. And said unto them all, men and brethren, ye know that how a great while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. You see, it's going to always be someone that's going to lead, take, stand up and take the lead. And they have to take the lead regardless of what other folks think, but they got to be consistent. Peter took the lead here. But in another case, in, in, uh, in Galatians, I think it was, Peter was standoffish, as if he didn't know the Gentiles. When James and some of the rest of them came down, there were other, there were other circumcision. Some of his, his friends that were, were the Jews that were still st steep in the Mosaic law. Paul didn't even talk with them. No one didn't want to eat with them. None. I mean, Peter didn't, rather. And Paul had to confront him to his face. Peter, you preaching, you was down there at the Jerusalem council. You were the, the, the keynote speaker, so to speak. You led the way, and now you don't want to even talk with them. Peter, you, you know what you're being? You're being hypocritical. And all that go along with you are being hypocritical. So we got to stand, got to stand firm, but we got to be consistent as well. So Simon Peter was one of the 12 apostles selected by Jesus. Later on, he did become the rock of the church and a leading figure in the church of God. You read about this in Matthew 16, 17 to 19. And the book of Acts describes how Peter led the apostles, Peter preached the gospel, and Peter worked miracles. All this is outlined in the book of Acts 1, 15 to 26, 2, 14 to 41, 3, 1 to 10, 8, 14 to 25, and 9, 32 to 35. I'd like to encourage you to read all those verses. That's a lot of reading, but it gives you a lot of information on the acts of the church as well. So please read that as well. So God had chosen Peter then to proclaim the gospel message to the circumcision, the Jews in Galatians 2, 7 to 8, and the Gentiles. But primarily Peter was assigned to the Jews. And it was part of a, of a long promised plan of God to offer redemption, not to just some people, but to all that believe. Not just the Jews, but all that believe. I want you to read Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 for more information on that. Now, let's talk about also how the conflict was resolved in God's work in verses number 8. And God, which knoweth the heart. I mean, I just stop right there. I mean, I, I, I'm going to read the commentary, but it's important to know that God knows our heart. God knew, knew their heart, the Jews and the Gentiles. We can't fool him. We can come clean to him because you all know what? He already knows. He already knows. God, which knoweth the heart, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. So after seeing a, in a vision, Peter went up to the house of Cornelius. You read about the story. And he preached the message of Jesus' anointing and of Jesus' ascension. 
So every person then, whether it be Jew or Gentiles, who believed in Jesus would receive the forgiveness of sins. And as Peter was preaching to the Gentiles, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. This is in Acts chapter 10. So the word is so powerful that it, it got immediate results. When Peter was preaching to the Gentiles, they heard this and they got that same experience that the Jews had gotten and nobody could deny that. That's a pretty big deal. So the gift then, the gift of the the gift was the evidence that the Gentiles uh, receiving the gospel and they're responding in faith, not by the law, but in faith. So this pouring out, this pouring out of the Spirit was a Pentecostal experience, like it was for the disciples in Acts chapter two, verses one through five. So then the presence of God's Spirit on the Gentiles indicated that these guys now are also in the family. These people are in the family of God because they got the Holy Ghost just like us. And it was a Pentecostal experience as it was in Acts chapter number two. So I want y'all to read Acts 11, chapter, chapter 11, verses 15 through 18 as well. Now, let's go on down to, let's see, verse number 10 here. Let's look at the response in this conflict. Verse number 10. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Now, the tendency of God's people to, to, to tempt God highlights something. It highlights their distrust of God and God's plans. How many of us think our plans are better than God's plans? How 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 well how, how good is that going for you so far? So 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 that was a big problem there. So now so requiring the Gentiles Gentile circumcision was a faulty assumption that God's gift of the Holy Ghost to the Gentiles was a mistake. It's almost like saying you know God, didn't, I mean y'all got it, but y'all I mean God I don't, I don't know what happened. God didn't really mean to give y'all the Holy Ghost. I mean I don't know what happened. But he didn't really mean to give it y'all. Y'all got it, but he did. That was a mistake. My goodness. And so we have to look at that as well, that uh, this tempting God is a real bad, bad thing. So in Jewish teaching, the term yoke was used to describe the people keeping, trying to keep the law of Moses was a yoke and to require law adherence, especially circumcision, was like the putting on, putting the burden of a yoke upon the neck of the Gentiles. And that, now, now, now keep this in mind. Jesus, nor Paul, was trying to get rid of the law. They weren't trying to abolish the law. The law was good of and, of and within itself to point out, to indicate what was right and what was wrong. But it was not strong enough to regulate, indicate but not regulate, identify but not justify. The law did not have that kind of power class. And so it, it was still good. I want you to read the, for the law is concerned of and, of and in itself. I want you to read Matthews 5.17 and also Romans 3.31, and also Romans 7 and verse number 12. Now, let's bring it on to a close now. And we see conflict resolved. Now, now if we take our time and really read the Word of God, the Word of God is full of conflict resolution. The Word, the word has the answer to the problem, not just deep, but every single problem. The, the, the resolution the solution is in the Word of God. Now it's up to us to take our time and read the Word of God and bring it out. And, and listen, don't try and change the Word of God and make the Word of God fit us. We got to fit the Word of God. If somebody comes and says, what's your opinion about this? What's your opinion about that? What do you think about what's going on over here and what's going on over there? What's going on in the, in the Middle East? What's going on over... I, see, I, I, can't, I, can't, I, can, I can give you what I think but the word is the final authority. What does the word say about this? What does the word say about end time events? What, do, what does the word say about wars and rumors of wars? What does the word say about sometimes father against son and son against father, mother against daughter? What does the word say about what's going on in this country right now? It, it, it's not, it's, listen, I'm going to tell you this. It's not catching God by surprise. All the things that happen in this world now, class, is not catching God by surprise. So what's my opinion? Well, let me just look at the word of God. I can tell you what the word says. Now, you, now you can, when you look at that, 
It's up to you what you do with that. Now, in verse number 11, we see our response. Conflict resolve, our response. But we believe, now this, this is still Peter talking. Peter started talking back in way back in, I think in verse seven. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So Peter, Peter ended this whole discussion here with, with a reminder of the, the spirit of the gospel, the core, the core of the gospel, the, the very center of the gospel. Peter kind of summed this thing up right here, that uh, salvation comes only through one avenue, not, not five, not 10, one avenue. What's that avenue, Peter? By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there was nothing and there is nothing you could do, I can do, we can do, including, including following the law to be saved. It's, it's by grace. It's faith by grace. Grace by faith. Faith and grace together is how we're going to get saved. Ain't nothing we can do. I want you all to read Acts chapter 13, verse 30, 38 and 39. And Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 through 17. Class, we all are, we, we need to thank God that we don't have to go, we don't have to try and keep 613 laws, narrowing it down to two laws, the, the 10 laws. But we can accept salvation by faith and the grace of God and not try and mix them up together. As I mentioned, Jesus and Paul, neither one came to abolish or do away with. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law. And he did fulfill the law. He came, he stepped down through 42 generations. He lived on this earth as a perfect, as a perfect man, three and a half years turning the world upside down, preaching the kingdom of God, the way of God, the will of God, the thought process of God, which is upside down to the way we think in our natural world. And there's a way we can live in line, in alignment with God's word, God's way. And that's going to be by receiving the Holy Ghost on the inside, believing in what he did at Calvary, believing that Jesus paid the price. He paid the penalty for sin. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. And none of us had the ability. None of us had the means. None of us had, none of us was perfect enough to take care, to, to, to satisfy the demands and the justice of heaven. Well, Jesus did it. God sent his only begotten son. And he died for this entire and the entire world. But we still got to believe. We got to accept what he did on behalf of on our behalf, our heaven, our, our defense attorney in heaven. And what he did for us will set us free from the bondage and bounds and shackles of sin, the dictations of sin, the tyranny of sin. God, what he did on Calvary, made all the difference in the world. And we ought to be glad. We ought to be thankful. Hey, look, y'all have a great rest of the week. Look forward to seeing you again. Want to get all your, your, your comments on what do you think about a, a Sunday School channel, a Sunday School YouTube channel. Just a, a friend of mine up in uh, Chicago. Uh, he's a pastor, as a matter of fact, in Chicago. And uh, he did. He has a Sunday School channel. And it's, it's just gotten, it's, it's gotten a lot more results because it's designated just for just for Sunday school. So we'll see how that works out in 20 in the very next year. Hey, y'all, y'all, any, any of your comments are welcome, whether it be on Facebook or YouTube, uh, or just call me in the rag, either one. I would appreciate it. Y'all have a great rest of the week, and we'll see you again on our next Sunday school review. Take care.